free is a better solution. What about the parents? How do they fit in, in this? Are the students trying to impress their parents? Oh, certainly. Um, but I also think that getting back to what we were talking about earlier, there are a number of strategies for parents early on in high school and even earlier that in addition to all the drug specific actions that a parent can take about speaking to their child about drugs and alcohol, they can monitor their activities, they can form a better relationship with their child so that they're more willing to talk to them about what's going on, they can disapprove of the drug use. In general, they can state that disapproval. And the other thing they can do is make sure that they themselves are role modeling prescription drug taking as a serious issue, taken only when completely necessary and under a doctor's care. So that role modeling is really important even early on. And what parents have to understand when your child transitions out of high school into college. And that's a big transition. That's a huge yeah, transition, transition for the child. You know, you're paying the bills and you're thinking about all that, but for your child, they've gone from being the, the top of the crop, now they're back at the beginning of the crop. They need to prove themselves. They're away from home. They're now responsible for their own health care through the Student Health Center. They're responsible for their own schedule. They're responsible in much larger ways for every decision throughout the course of the day. And you can have a great kid who has done great throughout their high school career and is presented with different options. So as Amelia said, it may be that your straight A student actually needs to take a few fewer credits that first semester so they get adjusted to school. You as a parent need to understand that while the university has told you about the great student health center, that's not a replacement for the kind of quality of health care you were providing them and the family physician was providing them on a day in day basis. So it's not about being a helicopter parent in college, but you do need to check in. You do need to, you know, not just send them away and we'll see you at Thanksgiving and hope everything comes out all right, but, which but how does it, happens. Yeah, but how does a parent supervise when you've got a student that is, you know, miles away? You've got, to, you've got to do a lot of things. What sources do you have? You've got to weigh in. You've got to express your concern. You've got to ask the kind of right questions. You know, you mean, you know, a Find lot of... Find out about their friends, who yeah. they're hanging out with, how they're spending their time, how they're spending their weekends, whether or not anything is coming up that's making them upset. And one particular uh, pet peeve I have is I think that college health services need to do a better job about communicating and involving parents yes. when appropriate rather than putting up a steel curtain of confidentiality and saying that these are independent operators when in fact they're not mature enough to do that without the help of parents when they're in trouble. I think the other thing that parents can do and that students need to realize is that there's a lot of health promoting activities mm. that mm -hmm. are necessary to make it through school and some of the things like getting enough sleep. Yeah. These are not chemical <laughs> substitutes for sleep. Mm -hmm. People think that they can burn the candle at both mm -hmm. ends, not sleep, and then this will replace good sleep. It doesn't. Biologically it doesn't, and certainly behaviorally it doesn't. It's good to get into that habit of getting enough sleep, exercising, other stress reduction techniques, really socializing, reaching for help when it's necessary, having a good relationship with your doctor. There's all these things that you can do. How about the transition from middle school to high school? It's How is that? It's another big transition. It's one, of, it's one of the most important ones in the substance abuse field. First of all, kids aspire upwards, so younger kids want to be like the older kids. But a lot of parents will say, my kid isn't in, co in high school yet. I don't really need to deal with these issues. You actually need to be talking with your child, understanding their, their network of friends, understanding the temptations they have as they're making that late elementary school exit into middle school. Middle school is the sweet spot for really this issue. The average age of first use in America is around 13 and a half years old, which means there's a whole lot younger and a whole lot older. So, you know, it's almost about having an age-sensitive conversation, ratcheting that up. We know, again, you look at the data, 90% of all adults who have an addiction began with their use in their childhood years. Or said another way, which is very popular in our field, you get a kid from about age 10 or 11 to age 20 or 21 without having a problem with these products, not using marijuana, not drinking to excess, not smoking, they're very unlikely to have a problem with that later in later life. On. So, you know, we're, we've talked a lot about high school and college, but to your point, you really have to back this up to late elementary school. Mm -hmm.
And it's not about you know, having the big scary drug talk with yelling and screaming and all that kind of stuff. It's about a series of very small conversations. I almost call it like mm -hmm. water torture. You know, asking what are you going on? A starlet has a problem that's in the news. What do you think about that? Yeah. Have the discipline to listen. If you do those little mm -hmm. tiny things on that ongoing basis, it creates that perception in your kid's mind that my parents disapprove about this. They're aware and they're concerned about it. We know kids love to push their parents' buttons, but they won't push them that last step. It, all of those things become protective factors in the kid's life that cause them to make slightly different, different situ decisions mm -hmm. as they move forward. No, Steve, you're so right. It's a, yeah. a series of teachable or motivational moments. When are the appropriate times yeah. to bring it up and to yeah. get kids to be thoughtful about examining other peers who get in trouble? Well, why do you think that happened? Kids don't really want to be in trouble. Yeah. Deviant peers are scary to them, and if you can set up a framework in which you give them alternatives that they can make choices that end up being safer, they'll usually do well, but you gotta keep at it. But and they don't wanna listen. be in trouble, but yet they might say, well listen, everyone is doing this. And once again, it turns out that those are false expectations. Mm -hmm. Everyone's doing it in a deviant group, right, but it really isn't that. everyone. Yeah. Yeah. You, have to help kind of, you need to help the kid understand there may be a school of a thousand kids and a thousand kids are not all smoking marijuana every evening and a thousand kids are not all drinking every day there are groups within that school that are doing that and you'll see those groups but that doesn't mean that is everyone and it doesn't mean that's you it's our family it's your future to be engaging in those in those different behaviors it's about again it all fits into that ongoing conversation and as a parent really having the discipline to listen to your child not just always talking at them but having a conversation conversation with or just putting something out there and listening to what they say. Somebody got arrested for something. What do you think about that? And in listening, they may say, you know what, it's too bad they got caught because otherwise they weren't doing anything wrong. And as a parent, you've got to kind of process that and move along with that so then you can come back with them and help them understand that. So what we tend to do as parents is kind of point counterpoint, like it's some cable TV yeah. show. You shouldn't do it. Anymore. It's really about that ongoing conversation, getting in tune with your kids. And as Amelia said, understand who your kids' friends are, understand who their parents are, and what are those different social contexts. And those are a lot of things that can give you those aha moments as a parent, I need to do something. But I think one of the things that we're all reinforcing is that the non-medical use of prescription drugs is part of this larger yes. drug problem. It can't be dealt with in isolation, and it's really part of the constellation of risk-taking behaviors mm -hmm. that is so common among adolescents. They are inherently vulnerable to risk-taking because they have... Because they're teenagers. Yeah. Because they're, they're, they're teenagers, and neurologically, their brains are wired for risk-taking and exploration. So how does the use of study drugs in high school compare with other drug abuse? Well, I mean, you know, alcohol and marijuana are certainly much larger in the 30 and 40 percentiles, whereas um, ADHD and prescription drugs are in the tens uh, of percentiles. So, you know, you know, you see the bar chart on the screen, marijuana blows them all away. But again, as Amelia said, this is part of almost the menu of things your child will be for, faced with. And as a parent, you can't say, you know, I'm okay with marijuana and a little bit of alcohol and occasional study drugs, but don't do any of the other don't. ones on the chart. It just doesn't work that way. And so we have very clear data that taking a stance of non-permissiveness is most effective. Taking a stance of zero tolerance that there's a bright line that you shouldn't cross, it's unsafe. At the same time, part of the difficult tightrope of being a parent is while you take that stance, you also know that they're likely to cross the line. And so you have to be able to do both things in a trick operation. I want you not to cross the line, <laughs> but if you do cross that line, I'm not going to chop your head off when you come and tell me about it because I want to keep a channel of communication open to be able to debrief and help you make a better choice next time. I need to have it both ways, hard as that is. But isn't there a little bit of a tightrope for you as a doctor? with your patients in terms of do I prescribe, don't I prescribe, what do I do, and what medicines? Sure, well every medical decision point is like that. Even Tylenol can cause people's livers to fall off on the floor. So <laughs> all of the medicines we use have potential as poisons. So one of the difficult things is to try to assess risk and benefit and make those difficult choices. And you get more than one chance. There's the outset, do you prescribe for any particular condition, including stimulants for ADHD? But it's not just the outset, it's also ongoing monitoring. What are the side effects? Do you have troubles? Are we looking at blood pressure, for example? Are we looking at heart rate? I'm now talking about stimulants. Mm -hmm. Are we talking about mood effects, which are 
vastly underappreciated side effect profiles of these medicines. Do they cause anxiety for patients? Do they cause depression for patients? Do they cause irritability and anger and mood swings and insomnia? Are we monitoring those things and are we looking at other drug use and are we looking at potential for diversion? So those are the kind of the conversations we try to have to make it a, a better outcome. And one of the common psychiatric disorders that's associated with the non-medical use of prescription stimulants is depression. And we're not really sure from the research whether or not the non-medical use is exacerbating and underlying propensity for there. depression mm -hmm. or whether or not um, it's really causing the depression. Um, but we know the again, answer is it's probably it's both, probably both. Yeah. in different circumstances. It's both the chicken and the egg in, right. in different patients. But when your son or daughter has depression symptoms, again, it may be a red flag for other substance use. And I don't think we've said this, but in context of what you're saying is you need to look at substance use as a health issue. Whereas Mark talks about that bright line. It isn't you cross the line and now you're a bad person or you're a lawbreaker, which is where this issue so frequently goes. Is a parent, you need to look at substance use in your teenager and your college student as a health risk and manage it like you do any other health issue that mm -hmm. faces your child. When you put that as your for forefront of your mindset, it isn't about you'll go to jail, you'll be a bad person, what will the neighbors think, all of that kind of stuff. It's about protecting your child's health, protecting their future. You go into a different mode as a parent because you've done everything for that child throughout their life. The well baby visits, the vaccinations, there's a sniffle where it ended up in Mark's office. <laughs> on and on and on and on and on. When it comes to substance abuse, it's kind of like, oh, you know, it's one of those things, they'll be okay, all kids go through it. You didn't say that about measles, you didn't say that about the flu, you really need to put it in that context. This is a health issue. I think what helps is that when parents recognize that there is a connection to academic yes. achievement. I yeah. really think that that's a lever. Without a quick okay. fix of another right. drug. Because <laughs> they are concerned about yeah. their kids' grades and their academic achievement because we're living in a very different world where they'll need those skills. And so the how kids do are equally it? concerned. Okay. The kids are equally concerned about their future as mm -hmm. well. It's both the motivation for what we're talking about, but it's also something they care very intensely about is are they going to be okay in the future right. so that's a good that's, valuable place to right. work and as professionals yeah. we have to appreciate mm -hmm. the pressures yeah I mean, not just dismiss them and say mm -hmm. they're bad parents we have to say listen we know that these are tough times we know that you're under considerable pressure here are some alternate strategies well we have reached that point in time in our program where I'm going to ask you for your final thoughts and give me with about oh 30 40 seconds what your thoughts are concerning our topic today of stimulants of the study drug misuse Amelia, I'll start with you. I think that the most important thing to realize is that this is part of a larger problem of substance use during adolescence and that there are things, luckily, that we know we can do. It's just a matter of implementing those strategies and being sustainable about those strategies. It's not about a one-time conversation or a one-time prevention program. It's something that you have to continually monitor and be vigilant about, whether you're a physician or a parent. You constantly have to be on your toes about this issue. Steve? I think following on that as a parent, you have to understand that you actually do have power on these issues. You have the ability to have those conversations and be an authentic voice in your child's life. You have the ability to safeguard medicines in your home. You have the ability to do a lot around this, understand your, your child's friends, understand their parents, understand their social situations. So a lot of times people will say, oh, this is just so tough. It's one of those things. I'm alien to my child's world. But again, we know kids who learn a lot at home half as likely to use, not pushing your parent that final step is a very important thing for a lot of young people. So as a parent, understand you've got that power. Have the conversations. It's not trite to say that, you know, have a conversation. It <laughs> actually does, in the data, show that it makes a difference. So you don't need to be an expert in pharmacology. You don't need to be Dr. Mark Fishman or Dr. Amelia Rhea. You need to be this kid's parents and show their love for them, show that you care for them, and it actually is helpful. Thank you. Dr. Mark? Well, I'll just emphasize that uh, as we started out at the beginning of the conversation, this really is a myth of study drugs. Uh, they have a popular conception as being for study, for enhancing academic performance. But the kids that are in trouble with them, the kids that are using them, are not kids that are using them in isolation just to go from a B plus to A minus. It's the same kids that are using other things and are in trouble with a broad array of risk behaviors, including other substance use. So study drugs is a myth. We want to look at why kids are fooling with misusing a variety of substances that get them in trouble. 
The bad news is that it's bad for them. The good news is, as we've heard, there's lots we can do to help them. At multiple points, we can prevent, we can treat, we can change the course and teach them to do better. Very good. Thank you. Well, that is all the time we have for today. Special thanks goes out to the partnership at drugfree.org for their assistance with this program. On behalf of Dr. Amelia Aria, Dr. Mark Fishman, and Steve Fiserv, I'm Stan Rhodes. Thanks for watching The Myth of Study Drugs, The Problem of Prescription Stimulant Misuse.